Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Kang Shen, and I am delighted to introduce today's uh, distinguished speaker, Professor Jennifer Rexford. Jennifer is the Gordon Wu Professor of Engineering and also Chair of Computer Science at Princeton University. After finishing her PhD from University of Michigan in 1996, she worked at AT&T Bell Labs or AT&T Research for eight years, then joined Computer Science Department of Princeton University in 2005, exactly 15 years ago. And she has been outstanding in every aspect receiving large number of uh, <clears throat> prestigious awards, including Grace Harper Award from ACM for Outstanding Young Computer Science Professional, and also ACM, the Ethna Lecturer Award, and also SICOM Award for Lifetime Contribution, and also IEEE Internet Award. She is also IEEE and ACM Fellow, and also a member of American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the National Academy of Engineering and Science. Without further ado, Jennifer, this is all for you. By the way, the uh, if you have a questions, please send the message. And at the end of her talk, she will go through some, if not all, of those questions and then answer them. Great. Thanks so much, King. It's a pleasure to be here, even if only virtually. And I'd like to make this as interactive as we can, given the limitations of Zoom. So by all means, put questions in the chat. And I'll stop it a few times during the talk to see if there are any questions. Uh, the internet is, is really a remarkable story, uh, an experiment that escaped from the lab within my lifetime to become a you know, global communications medium. And part of the beauty of the decisions the early designers made that helped make that possible was to have you know, a best effort packet delivery infrastructure that's quite simple, leaving a lot of the functionality to the end host applications and, and other services that run on the end host computers. And to me, the, the real takeaway lesson of their early design decision was by putting a lot of the key functionality of the internet in programmable devices, the computers that we all run, that they really enabled who could affect change, who could innovate, lowering the barrier to innovation, democratizing innovation, if you will. And what we've seen as a result of that is remarkable innovation in the devices that connect to the internet, the applications that run above the internet, and even the media that support the internet from below. The one thing we haven't seen is remarkable innovation, ironically, on the inside of the internet. And I would attribute that to the lack of programmability, that, that where you can program, you unleash innovation by allowing a larger set of people to innovate. And so what I focused on a lot throughout my research, even in my graduate work at Michigan, was in trying to make the infrastructure more malleable, more, more programmable, to enable it to adapt to new, new demands and to, again, unleash innovation. And uh, you might say, well, why do we need that innovation on the inside? I mean, the whole point was that the inside be uh, a best effort packet delivery mechanism, simple. Um, but in fact, what we've seen on the inside is, is that the internet's design is complicated over the years. It's over-specified through slow standardization processes, standards embodied in fixed function hardware developed by a small set of vendors who sell closed equipment where software and hardware are bundled together. And the interfaces for configuring the equipment are quite baroque and complicated. And as a result, few people can innovate. And even when I was at at and a company that buys perhaps more network equipment than any other, uh, there was very little ability to, for us to have much say over what the boxes did. And so what you end up with is that the equipment vendors are the primary ones innovating and adding new features. It's a slow and laborious process that where the people who own the network are, are kind of stuck outsourcing that to the, the vendors that sell them equipment. So you might say again, why do we care? The inside of the internet isn't the point, but I would argue it's what determines what, whether the internet is performant, secure, cost-effective, reliable, um, protecting of user privacy and more. 
And so that we should care that the inside of the internet is more open to innovation. And in fact, as a research community, there's a little bit of inside baseball now, but within my research community, we have spent tons and tons of effort creating open source hardware and software at different layers, the packet forwarding devices, the interfaces to packet forwarding, the control software that tells the packet forwarding what to do. We've created lots of research programs and programmable networks in and above the internet. We've created programmable test beds for trying out our ideas. I would argue we're actually desperate as researchers to, to you know, have the internet be more programmable in part because it facilitates our research, but in part because it facilitates the kind of change we'd like to see in the internet and, and the ability to make that change. So what I wanna talk about in this presentation is we've tried for so long to make the internet more programmable and what, what works and what doesn't. And, and what have we learned along the way or more specifically, what have I learned along the way? And I wanna talk about a number of projects I've worked in since grad school through now. And many of them were failures. So I'm gonna to try to opine on the ones that failed. Uh, as well as the ones that had some success. And I'll also talk about projects others did that I didn't contribute to, but I, I'll, I'll repine a little bit about why those projects succeeded or didn't. So with the broader goal being to get some lessons learned about what it takes to affect change in the internet and what it takes to make the internet more amenable to innovation. And the high order punchline of the talk is a, is a sort of strategy I would call sort of keeping it real. That to, to really affect fundamental change in the internet, we have to be ambitious. But if we're not pragmatic, that ambition gets, gets lost and we're not able to actually affect change. And so there's going to be sort of two lessons to that. One is um, a, a sort of pragmatism that involves staying in touch with reality, that to affect change by cre getting, collecting real data about the network, building real software, attracting real users, understanding the technology push and the market pull that makes real change happen. This is sort of a, a change what you can. The, the disadvantage, though, of focusing only on this is that we can end up in sort of a local minima where we're only changing the incremental things we're allowed to change. And so I would argue this needs to be counterbalanced by a larger effort to shape what future reality might be, to create new artifacts others can build on, to build communities, uh, to enable new kinds of change that are maybe out of reach today, but to lay the groundwork for them to be made tomorrow. And so that's the, the balance between ambition and pragmatism I'm sort of advocating for in the talk. So I'm going to do this through a I'm going to show my age now, a 25-year retrospective, starting with my time I was a PhD student at Kang's when I was uh, at Michigan as a grad student. I'll just briefly, if you'll indulge me a moment, I'll, I'll talk a tiny bit about grad school, uh, especially since this is where I did my graduate work. And then I want to tell you a little bit about my time at AT&T, both other work that was going on in parallel in the academic community at the time, as well as some things I was working on. And then I'll talk more recently about what's happened in the last 15 years about uh, programmable networks. So and this is all work that's been done with a ton of different people. I'm going to uh, mention at the end a number of the people involved in the work, but by no means is any of this work I did alone, quite the contrary. So when I went to grad school in 1991, parallel computing was in its heyday. A lot of people, myself included, were really tantalized by the idea that you could harness multiple small processors together to take on tasks bigger than anyone could do alone. Predict tomorrow's weather before tomorrow for example. And these were often interconnected in regular topologies. And part of the reason I came to Michigan was Kang's group was building a machine of this type and I could get in on both the hardware and software design of that machine. And our goal was to handle a lot of different workloads, uh, scientific applications, real-time applications, uh, and so on. And in particular, we recognized that the network needed to behave differently for these applications. A real-time application cared about deadlines, best effort about throughput, and the right kind of routing and flow control might depend on the patterns of the workload. And so we worked a lot on how to make the little devices programmable, little routers sitting inside a single parallel machine. Um, but in the end, parallel computing didn't take off, or at least it didn't then. And in some ways, Moore's law wasn't over yet. Now, 25 years later, it looks like it might be uh, almost over, 20 years later, almost over. And in the end, application development ended up being a lot harder than building the parallel machines. So I have a, the reason I have this picture of a coffee mug is at the time I used to go to parallel computing companies and they would always give you a mug about you know, the connection machine or the Cray or whatever. So I have this collection of, of mugs of now bankrupt uh, parallel computing companies, a sort of a little, a little shrine to this lesson, if you will. But I just want to say that part of the difficulty here also was that we didn't have real data uh, to evaluate our research. It was very hard to get real workloads at the time. And custom chips that we built were lagged behind the silicon features that were available in commercial chips, sort of an inherent challenge that a lot of academic research faces. But I, I should say, I don't mean to be so negative. Actually, in fact, a lot of the things that were worked on at that time have seen currency and data center networking today. 
the sort of modern factories of data centers are in many ways large scale multi computers of a sort. So one might argue I should have been more patient and, and switched to T, if you will, um, that Moore's law is coming to an end now and, and data centers actually use ideas like this. So don't take my sort of skepticism about my, my PhD work as sort of a, a, a long term thing. It was more at the moment, it wasn't quite the right time for this kind of work. And yet the idea of programmability as a way to customize the network, I think did have some longer term potential. And so I continued to be something I was preoccupied with. So towards the end of my time in graduate school in Kang's group, we were looking at what kind of operating system to run on the parallel machine we were building. And I got really interested in network stacks and started learning about networking and the X kernel and the World Wide Web exploded and people started doing really interesting research studying the internet through measurement. And uh, asynchronous transfer mode started to emerge as a new kind of network device um, that were kind of similar to the multi-computer routers we were looking at in Kang's group. And I thought, wow, I could pivot a little bit to think about the network that is becoming this global network, not the one inside a box, but the one writ large across the internet. And maybe what I know about is useful because some of the things that go on in these devices is not that different. The only kind of devices I was familiar with. So when I went to at and I continued to work on asynchronous transfer mode networks and how to route in them, how to schedule, how to shape traffic, and eventually how to carry internet traffic over them. And then eventually as that technology fell by the wayside, uh, I started looking at another kind of technology I call IP, not over ATM, uh, which is sort of what I work on now. And so I like to joke, I've sort of worked on, on several technologies that, that didn't really take off. And in fact, I skipped one. I also worked on routing and telephone networks as well. So I've worked on routing and multi-computer networks, routing and ATM networks, and now you know, routing and other topics on the internet. But each of those have a lesson, I think, to tell us about how networking works today. And we'll see later in the talk that one of the challenges in evaluating ideas, even when I was inside a company, inside at and it was difficult to get real data. And once I was able to start getting real data, it became really clear that the collecting of that data was a, a research topic in its own right. And that understanding how to manage a network using that data would be an interesting question to explore. To me, for me at the time, it was like, oh, I'll just go ask for some data and run my experiments and be done with it. And then it kind of took on a life of its own. The second is the ability to carry traffic over ATM networks, which are sort of circuit switched style networks, more like the fun network. Some of the ideas there that you might take a group of related packets and handle them like a circuit uh, is gonna come up again later in the talk. And that's something, a lesson from, from these style uh, of networks. Now in parallel to all this, in the, in the academic community, a hot topic at the same time was an area called active networks. And and the idea there, the researchers who pursued this, I wasn't involved in this at all, they were really concerned that the internet was becoming difficult to innovate. The same points I was making earlier in the talk. They wanted to be able to enable experimentation with new networking ideas and also to enable future networks to accommodate innovation. They also explored a couple of different models for doing that. One extreme approach of carrying code inside packets so that individual packets of data might carry the code that would run on their behalf to allow end users much more say over how their traffic is handled, or that the devices themselves should be programmable so that you could run programs uh, by, on behest of the network administrator. So at the time, this was quite exciting, the idea of programmability to enable innovation, to demultiplex traffic in the network into software programs, a unified way of thinking of adding software functionality to the network. Lots of really interesting ideas here. And in fact, they animate in many ways things that I'm interested in that, that I'll talk more about. Uh, but at the time, there were two questions that were sort of unanswered. Who should really be the programmer of the internet? Should it be the end user or should it be the network administrator? From my point of view, I was pre preoccupied at AT&T with the network administrator, whereas a lot of active network research was focused on the end user. And should we worry about performance while we're making the network programmable? Worrying about it too early can constrain your thinking, but worrying about it too late can lead to adoption problems. And so these were sort of two, two issues on my mind as that community was grappling with active networking. And so for me, I really became interested in the network administrator as the programmer and performance as a first order concern. And so I just wanna tell you a tiny bit about some of the work uh, at at and driven I think by my, my really strong wish to work with real users, in this case, the network management people, the network operators and real data, the things I was sort of hungry for throughout the time I was in grad school and even the first few years I was at AT&T. 
I, I also became, as I talked to the network operators, aware that they were really doing heroic things to hold the internet together with very little scaffolding, very little methods. The internet wasn't really designed with its management in mind, and it really shows. And so I became aware that they were really at a high level over and over again, trying to design a control loop, measuring the network by whatever means necessary, controlling the network by whatever knobs the network, network vendors would make available to them. And in the middle doing analysis or optimization to optimize the flow of traffic, to do maintenance in a way that doesn't affect real users to detect and block attacks and so on. I became really fascinated with the idea that even if we're not allowed to program the network because the vendors don't let us, maybe we can program above the network and implement this control loop in ways that network administrators would benefit from. So I became interested in the management system being the, the place where programmability might be possible. Um, and as a result, this is where the pragmatism part of the story comes in, taking the existing routers as a given, not just their hardware, but their software too, because the companies that sold that equipment didn't allow even AT&T to change what code ran on the boxes that AT&T itself bought. So before I go into a little more detail here, are there any, any questions or comments? You can feel free to either unmute or, or ask in the chat. Okay, I think I'll just go on a little further then. So one question we thought about was how to route the traffic in a way that would minimize congestion. So the way networks worked at the time was they would run like an individual network like AT&T's part of the internet would run a protocol where every router was a node in this picture and every edge is a link between two routers. And there would be weights on the links that would and the routes that the traffic would take would be the shortest path based on these weights. So you would travel, for example, on this light blue path because two plus one plus five is the smallest path that gets between the entry point and the exit point for this traffic. Now, the network administrators were given a protocol that was standardized and implemented in the boxes where the only thing they could do would be to, to set the values of these weights. Now, the people who designed these protocols figured these weights might be set based on the physical distance that the traffic would travel over that edge, or maybe something inversely proportional to the capacity of the links. But in practice, neither of those two heuristics end up delivering traffic efficiently. So the problem the network administrators implicitly are solving is kind of backwards. They have to pick these weights so that when the routers compute shortest paths based on them, the traffic flows in a sensible way. This is not the way you would define the world if you were a network administrator. This is what you do when you, know, you have a nail and uh, you don't have a hammer, you have to put it in with a screwdriver. But that's what, what they had to do. They had to essentially uh, express all of their desires through these numbers that the routers would use to compute paths. So the goal here to be clear is not to compute shortest paths based on a weighted graph, is to pick the weights so that the shortest paths are the ones you want. And this was a recurring theme throughout the talk, working backwards to answer the question you actually want because the equipment doesn't let you answer the one you want. So what did you have to do then? You need to know the offered load between the entry and exit points in the network. You need to know the graph and the capacities of the edges. And then you've got an optimization problem to figure out the weights that will, let's say, minimize the most heavily utilized link in the network. And so we did a lot of work on collecting the traffic matrix, collecting the topology, and solving this optimization problem. And I won't go through the technical details, but each of them are actually quite interesting and thorny problems uh, in their own right. And just to give an example, if one of the links on this path were congested, particularly if this link were congested, if you were to increase its weight to three, you might see this bottom path become shorter than the longer path, now longer path, and you would divert a fraction of the traffic away from this link. And so essentially what we did was create for the network administrators a better network-wide way to reason about how they might go about doing that. So, but in the end, after doing that work of how to measure the traffic matrix, how to optimize routing and so on, we ran into a lot of interesting challenges that were perhaps actually more interesting than the original problem we thought we were gonna solve. As I mentioned, measuring the traffic matrix or inferring it from more limited data was itself an interesting sort of tomography problem to actually get the net network to divulge what offered load it was carrying. The optimization problems were hard. The optimization problem ends up being an NP hard one. The protocols have all sorts of peculiar quirks that if you don't model them quite right, you don't actually follow what the network actually does. So we spent a ton of time validating that our models reflect a reality in terms of how the network routers would actually behave. And finally, the big problem we ran into is that every time we changed the link weight to make the network less congested, we would cause transient disruption 
for the traffic already being carried in the network. And that was a problem as well. And so we ended up having to design effective ways to make change to the network without the change itself being worse than the problem that it was solving. And, and so finally, after a lot of effort, we're able to get all of these techniques deployed and operational on AT&T's network. But really this picture is where all the action was. The algorithms work on the previous slide, while interesting was, was nowhere near as meaty as, as some of these operational questions. So another thing I wanted to mention, I, I, in my, when I was at AT&T, I used to work the night shift in the operations center to understand better what the network administrators were doing. I wish I had done this earlier in my career and I wish I did it more often now. Uh, working the night shift with the people actually holding the internet together. I heard lots of war stories and interesting anecdotes, and it really made me realize how much I was abstracting away of the things that actually mattered to running a real network and it informed my work in, in really significant ways. So if you ever have an opportunity to talk with people that do the actual work of making a system run, I, I highly, highly recommend it. So the other thing is we did this work, we studied how to make the flow of traffic more efficient. We studied DDoS, denial of service attack mitigation. We were marching through a whole bunch of different ways to make network management better. And then we started to become concerned that continuing in this way was gonna be really ineffective. And I'll, I'll explain why. If you look at the way networks actually work, they forward packets. There's a data plane that forwards, buffers, drops, marks. There's very, very simple streaming al algorithms on packets. At the behest of a control plane, that in legacy equipment is standardized. Those are the kind of protocols I was just talking about. And then finally, there's a management plane that collects data and configures these protocols. And so all of our work was making this management plane bigger and bigger and bigger, inverting whatever the control plane did, trying to coax it into doing what we wanted it to do, always adding a lot of complexity to be able to indirectly make the network do our bidding. And as we did more and more of this, it became clear that we were making the management plane more and more and more complicated and harder to reason about. Sure, automating things that used to be done manually and hopefully doing them better, but at what cost? At the cost of really complex software that was hard to reason about. So we started thinking of what to do. And I chatted with some people at at and who worked on the telephony network. And they told me about this work from the early 80s on what was called the network control point, which in the phone network separated the actual delivery of telephone calls from the control that set those calls up. Now at at and it was often the case that old timers who worked on the phone network would tell you stories and you would have to patiently listen to them. And eventually you would think, okay, they're just those old bellheads telling you stories again and they just don't understand the internet. And at first I thought it was one of those kind of conversations, but I humored the person and went and read these papers from the early eighties. And what they talked about was separating the control plane from the data plane that the network control and the network action didn't have to run on the same box. And that logical centralization of control would enable flexibility, scalability, innovation, and more. And I thought, wow, that's actually pretty mind blowing. That's pretty cool. But what would that mean inside an ISP? We're not setting up phone calls, we're routing data packets. And I thought, well, most of the problems I've looked at are on network wide route control. Could you separate routing from routers? Is that a weird idea or is that a good idea? And in particular, we, how can we do that when we're not even allowed to define the interface that we have to the equipment? Because again, we're stuck with this pragmatic constraint. And so the idea came to a group of us that we should trick the routers into doing what we want them to do and tell them what they should do. And I'll tell you a little bit about that part of the story next. So the idea was to separate routing from routers, that routers normally talk amongst themselves to compute routes. What if we had a computer tell the router the answer? What if we gave it only one choice? So that it had no choice but to pick the answer we gave it. So essentially what we did is we took information from the neighboring networks that connected to AT&T, fed it to a computer and spit out the answers to what, how those individual routers in AT&T's network should forward their packets. Essentially short circuiting the control plane by brainwashing the routers into doing what we want. The nice thing is this was very much incrementally deployable. AT&T's neighbors would speak to us in the same way they normally do, talking to some general purpose software rather than to a router, but they don't know the, know the difference. And no changes to the routers because we're force feeding them the answer to the computation that we do. And you would think, okay, well, this is a horrible idea because how could one computer do all the work of, of hundreds of routers? But it ends up that routers run often multi-year old CPUs and have relatively limited memory. And it ends up that the computation that all those routers do is tremendously redundant, that many of them are doing almost the same thing. And so there's a lot of opportunity to take a high-end server with a lot of memory 
and amortize the computation of multiple routers work among, that, among them. And it's possible in a single box at the time, this is now 2004, 2005, that a single high-end server could do all the work, even for a network as large as AT&T's. And of course, you can't just have one computer because if it crashes, that's a bad thing, but you could just replicate now that single uh, centralized entity to have multiple copies. A gift from Moore's Law, ironically, that I've gotten a lot better in the 10 years since my PhD. So this idea of having a single computer be the brain for the entire network seemed like a crazy idea at the time and we had to get people at AT&T willing to deploy it. So pragmatism again. We went to the different groups within AT&T and tried to find users that would cover different business units inside the company. Security, the security group really wanted to block denial of service attacks and was having trouble doing it. The people running virtual private networks for enterprise customers had customers annoyed that they didn't have direct control over how the traffic traversed AT&T's network. And the interactive applications, like at the time, Sony EverQuest and other online gaming applications were frustrated every time AT&T did maintenance on its network that video game users would have their games interrupted. Harkening back to some of the problems we grappled with a few minutes ago in the talk. So we went through for each of these three use cases and built applications that would run on the new platform we built. And no one of these applications alone probably would have gotten the work deployed, but because all three of these groups were clamoring for this extra flexibility, we're able to get at and to deploy the platform we built and run these applications in practice. So I'll just tell, talk really briefly about the online gaming case. So what was happening is users would be playing a game like a first person shooter game. at and would need to take a router down for maintenance to fix a broken card or to upgrade the operating system. And for a period of time, the routers would be talking amongst themselves to compute the new routes. And in the meantime, the actual traffic for the gaming application is being dropped, delayed, delivered out of order. And in fact, in one instance, 20,000 video game players died at the same time in a game of Sony EverQuest uh, because at and did maintenance. So ironically, at and is doing maintenance to make the network better and the uh, users are complaining because the application's behavior is disrupted. So, so what can you do about this is a really, really simple idea, but fortunately not hard to do when you have central control. You know ahead of time, you wanna take that box out of the network. You know ahead of time, you want the other routers to route a different way. But the protocols don't give you a way to say that, but the network administrator or a centralized system acting on the network administrator's behalf can, to take the steps in the right order so that nothing goes wrong. So in particular, what we do here is have the routing control platform tell the router on the other end to start using the other exit point in the network while the first exit point is still up so that packets in flight are successfully delivered. And in the meantime, after the traffic is successfully starting to flow only through the second exit point to take the second, uh, the other egress point down. Really trivial idea, it's just to do things in the right order. Something it's hard to tell the protocol to do in a distributed fashion, but pretty easily to do centrally. So there's a question in the chat from, from Trevor, how does the central computer managing things connect to the router? So it's connecting in, in the, the deployment we did at AT&T, connecting over the network itself. Okay, so it has like a mini virtual network or something? Yeah, there are a lot of ways you could do this in, in practice. In the simple case in AT&T's network, we use the intra-domain routing protocol to have this box look like another router inside the network. More generally, you could imagine what you just said is the sort of generalization of that, where you could have a separate virtual network that runs distributed protocols just for the purpose of communication between the controller and the network devices, and, uh, and not for more scalable kind of communication you'd normally need to support. Yeah, it's a good question. There's no, there's no, fair, uh, no free lunch here. You do have to do something to bootstrap. And in later deployments, like for example, Google uh, deploys similar kinds of solutions now in their backbone they run uh, the distributed control plane amongst the routers, just in case the controller dies. And in fact, at and did that in our deployment as well. So if our, if our box died, you would at least the worst case is you'd devolve back to normal routing. It wouldn't cause the, mm -hmm. the, the, the brain dies, the body continues to function, even, even if it doesn't have all the bells and whistles. There's another question, can the centralized function be distributed? Yes, indeed. And in fact, in practice, I think you would want that. And indeed, more recent deployments of these ideas do. So you might replicate for reliability. That's all we did. But you could imagine having a controller in each geographic region. And that's what Google does. And I think other, other deployments do as well, particularly in settings where you would care about latency. I think latency is even more important today than it was when this work was done, but definitely. The ability to actually do the entire computation in one box helps you there though, because it's an awful lot easier 
to distribute for latency and for reliability than it is to distribute for scaling. If you had to distribute for scaling, you'd have to shard the content and it would be, it'd be quite difficult to, to manage. So fortunately, the Moore's law solves that problem for us. Which of the three applications benefit the most from the RCP? That's a great question. I have to think about that. I think the, the maintenance one was the first one because I think that was just, and it wasn't even related to new service offerings. It was related to customers who were complaining. So I think in a way, I don't know if benefits are kind of loaded word, but I think the one that really got it done was the maintenance one because at and had to do maintenance and customers were vigorously complaining every time they did. The other two applications are a little bit more about emerging services that were becoming important at the time. And so I think DOS with the denial of service attack mitigation was next because that was also quite severe when it happened. And the virtual private network one was a little more niche, but there was a business unit that cared about it quite a bit. So that certainly helped. Yeah, great question. Any other questions? It's probably a good time to, to pause because this is an end of another, another section. How well, I think simple? you kind of answered the, the question, the second question about decentralizing. Because the whole idea of the internet was to decentralize things, right? Yeah. I mean, the, it, it was a full tolerant story originally. And what you're doing is this RCP is if you knock it out, but you're saying that even if you knock it out, you can still use the network. Right, so there's a bit of a cheat going on there in that there's still the distributed protocol running underneath as a backup. Uh, that, and, and second, that the central controller really isn't centralized. And there's a kind of a joke. I mean, we use this term logically centralized, which is kind of a lame uh, term. Mm -hmm. it, really, it really means distributed. <laughs> so, um, and I, I say that in a cheeky way, but it's sort of true. I mean, the idea is the abstraction to the network administrator should be that it's a centralized network-wide configuration of high-level intent. And in practice, if it, it has to be implemented in a distributed way to make it scalable, performant, and reliable, so be it. But at least we can design it with that in mind, rather than having the level of distribution be at the level of individual network devices, which is what was the prevailing wisdom before that. But yeah, it has to be distributed, really, and then in practice to, to address scale, performance, and reliability. It just doesn't have to be scaled in the way it normally had been. How would central control manage unplanned outages? Right, good question. So the unplanned outages are handled by the routing control platform doing the same computations the routers would have done had the routers been running the algorithm. And that can mean you know, picking the best, best exit point to leave the network, the shortest path through the network to reach the exit point and so on. So in many ways, in fact, the first thing we built was a routing control platform that computed exactly the same answers the routers would have computed. No bells and whistles, no new features for denial of service attack mitigation or anything else. Just showing that a box alone could do what the whole network was doing by itself. And then finally, we started adding the ability to override the normal default behavior, if you will, to handle these special use cases on top. There's a question about the open compute project. Yeah, definitely highly relevant. And more broadly, the, the work on software-defined networking and software-defined infrastructure is quite relevant here. In many ways, this is a, an early precursor of, of that area and with a very specific focus on internet service provider routing rather than the, the larger picture. Yeah, great question. Any, any other questions? So, so next, an interesting thing happened. Um, Hui Zhang, who's a professor at Carnegie Mellon, came to visit AT&T on sabbatical. And he got a group of us involved in a project that he and Nick McEwen at Stanford were involved in called the 100 by 100 project. And we told our uh, Hui about the work we were doing. And we were very apologetic. We're like, well, we're doing it centrally because we don't have a choice and Cisco won't let us talk to the routers in any other way. And so we're doing, it, we're doing this. And he said, gee, you know, even if you were allowed to do it differently, maybe this would still be the right way to do it. And he gave us a kind of a pep talk, if you will, that maybe logical centralization of the network control is actually a good idea, not just a, a hack to get around the fact that we weren't allowed to do what we wanted to do. And I think he was right. We didn't sort of see it at the time because we were so preoccupied with the, the day to day things we were doing. And he also said that maybe this is actually a good idea, not just in ISP networks, not, uh, but maybe in other enterprise settings as well. And so we started thinking, well, if you could design what the equipment did, what would you do? And we came up with this idea we called the 4D architecture. And you can tell by the fonts here that this was an idea from 2004, 2005, because the, I kept it in these fonts just because it's sort of quaint. But um, the big high level idea was that you have three things you want. Network level objectives driving the decisions the network makes, not local views. Network wide views to make sure those objectives can actually be executed. 
and direct control over how the packets get forwarded rather than indir indirect control over the algorithms used to compute that state. And so high level objectives would go through a central decision plane that would disseminate decisions down to the data plane to actually have them executed. And a discovery plane would make sure that you constructed the measurement data you needed to know the network topology and traffic and more. So those are the three ideas, network-wide visibility, direct control, integrated through network-wide objectives. This is the control loop I talked about earlier, right? Measure, analyze and optimize and control. Just now you know, put into a layer stack with, with uh, cheesy fonts. So that's all, that's all well and good. At that time, I left AT&T to go to Princeton. I stayed for an extra bit of time to get this RCP deployed in AT&T's backbone, and then I left to come to Princeton. And, and when I came to Princeton, I thought, hmm, I really like to think more now about how to make networks inherently easier to manage, not bolt on network management on top of legacy equipment, but how can I actually change the network so management's inherently an easier thing to do? So I wanted to revisit all the old questions again, but, but with the ability to change the network infrastructure. And yet I was puzzling over leaving industry, how was I gonna keep my, my feet on the ground in understanding how the technology actually worked and how to affect change? And Larry Peterson, who was at Princeton already at the time, it was, was um, actively building an experimental platform called Planet Lab. There was a virtualized programmable distributed systems test bed to allow people to play with their research ideas. And it was his, his reaction to the failure of research and active networking, something he himself was a part of at the time, a more pragmatic take. Give people Linux virtualized on a server and let them run experiments on a slice of a Linux machine uh, on multiple machines all over the world and see what they come up with. And so talking to Larry was interesting. It made me feel the active network ideas had some currency and importance and, and there was a way to make it real. And yet at the same time, Larry and his, and his colleagues were thinking about distributed systems research, not networking. So I was still puzzling over how could you take these ideas and, and make it real at the networking layer. And so I spent a lot of time working with Larry on how to make Planet Lab operate one level lower on, on network equipment. So, in parallel to all of this, other people were having the same kind of uh, conversations. The 100 by 100 project that Nick McEwen and, and Hui Chang were involved in were also puzzling over how would you do logically centralized control in an enterprise, in a campus. And the Ethane project at Stanford that Nick McEwen led started thinking about logically centralized access control to be able to block unwanted traffic. And they did a really exciting project that um, later led them to realize that the interface that they needed to the data plane needed to be something more flexible. And so they started to define, and I got involved in this later, a standard called OpenFlow that would abstract what the data set, the data plane is able to do to forward packets. That most devices that forward packets at high speed at, at their heart are simple. They parse a packet, they match on some of the bits that have been parsed, an IP address, a MAC address, and they take a simple action on the packets that match a particular rule. They drop it, they forward it out a particular port or do something else. Match action processing. All these marketing terms we use in networking, router, switch, firewall, network address translator, load balancer, all of these are just different versions of exactly which bits you match on and exactly what simple action you take on matching packets. The OpenFlow standard was pragmatic. It didn't design new hardware. It didn't do anything really, except to say that's a general uh, design pattern and we can have an open API to it that the vendors don't get to control. And so the OpenFlow standard came out as a, as a nice way to abstract the interface to the underlying hardware. And it was eased by the fact that there was an emergence of uh, merchant silicon vendors, uh, Broadcom, Marvell, Intel, and others that were starting to make chipsets that router vendors could buy. So you didn't have to be one of a small number of companies that had your own silicon foundry to make a router or a switch. You could buy these chips. And it became possible to start thinking not only about how to create open interfaces because the Technology was starting to be a bit more open, but a lot more vendors were also interested in building products and many of them were more open to having a standard interface to their equipment than the established vendors were. And guess what? There were a bunch of data center operators like Google and Microsoft and others who were starting to build data centers who wanted that flexibility. And so it was sort of a perfect storm in the sort of 2008 to 2010 timeframe to do this. But at the beginning, the focus of the academics, myself included, was to think about programmable control. Now we can go below the management plane to the control plane because we now are talking directly to the packet forwarding hardware using at least a better interface than the clumsy one that we used in my AT&T work. And so we started to look at what it would mean to deploy ideas like this on a campus. 
And we did a deployment at Princeton and at Stanford and Georgia Tech and a number of other schools. And we ran a bunch of experiments and learned a lot of stuff. And around that time, Jonathan Smith at Penn, who's now at DARPA, uh, reached out to me and some others and said, hey, you know that active networking stuff we worked on a while ago, I think there's, a, there's an opportunity to go back and think about it again. Now the time is right. So let's get a programming languages researcher and a networking researcher at several schools together and, and figure it out. And that's how I got introduced to my own colleague, David Walker, indirectly through, through Jonathan suggesting that we start talking. And similarly at Penn and at Harvard, uh, faculty on both sides of the aisle got together and started thinking about if the networks are gonna be programmable, what's the language we should use to program them? For me, it was just a, uh, an eye opener. It's like, oh, networking is not only about scarcity. It's not only about optimizing routing and blocking unwanted traffic, making sure the resources are used well. It's also about getting the right abstractions for expressiveness. That's a kind of question I'd been struggling with but hadn't been able to put my finger on. But the programming languages people, that's their bread and butter. And so first thing we did was we started trying to program on top of OpenFlow directly. And we experienced a lot of pain. The interface was low level and Baroque, open for sure, but still pretty low level. Not a linguistic formalism. It's an API, not a linguistic formalism. And so every time we experienced pain, we tried to generalize and abstract and eventually develop higher level abstractions for programming OpenFlow networks. And in particular, what was great about OpenFlow is it provided network-wide visibility and direct control, the things that, that we wanted in the 4D project. Uh, and it had a simple data plane abstraction that could be explained to others, including programming languages researchers who might frankly find the alphabet soup of networking uh, quite frustrating and, and intimidating otherwise. But it was still pretty bad. It was a lot about bit patterns and ternary content addressable memories and rules and parsers and very low level details and uh, very low level management of resources. And it gets worse because if you wanna write a modular application, they have to share the same rule table, they have to process the same packets. And really you haven't gotten rid of distributed systems problems. You still got a controller and a data plane and in fact, multiple data planes that have to be able to talk to one another with latencies between them. So you're still not really sidestepping the problems that distributed systems brings to the table. And so these are the kinds of things we ran into as we tried to build applications on OpenFlow. Sure, the applications were fun, hopefully useful, but in the end, quite painful to develop. So we're still, again, in, at a control plane, but now with at least a better interface directly to the data plane using OpenFlow. And so we went back to that control loop I talked about. We developed query abstractions for collecting measurement data. We developed operators for composing um, modular applications together so that we could operate on the same packets with more than one piece of functionality to load balance a web server and then route traffic to it while collecting data about it. And we also figured out ways to control the network that wouldn't cause transient disruptions of the type that hampered us so often at at and And so in the interest of time, I'm not gonna go into most of that, but I just wanna briefly tell you about the last one just as an example, because it, it's a recurring theme. How do you update the network without causing transient disruption? You wanna make the network better, but not make it worse while you're fixing it. So the high level idea is that we'd like a really simple abstraction that I have a particular policy, a way I want packets to be handled and I wanna change it from one policy to another. I've got a distributed set of network devices that each need to be updated. And I, wanna, I want to update the configuration as if it happens in one fell swoop, but in practice I can't. And in fact, I'd, I don't want the network to go through weird intermediate states where some of the devices are updated and some aren't. And in fact, it'd be nice if I could assume that packets were handled entirely by one policy throughout their journey or entirely by another, because then as long as those two policies satisfy a property I care about, they don't have loops. They don't allow unwanted traffic. They don't drop traffic I care about. If I know the before and the after satisfy that, if I don't have to reason about what happens in the middle, that's an awful lot easier because then I just have to test that the policy before and the policy after achieve my constraints and my goals. But I do have this problem in the end that we do have to update the devices one at a time because even if we up try to update them at the same time, there'll be differences in exactly when changes take place. And there'll be packets in flight that might have experienced one policy at one switch and one other at a different switch. But now we've got a better interface than what we had when we did the work I did at AT&T. We've got OpenFlow. And so the high level idea, and it's, it's really a simple one, is to essentially do two-phase commit. We're gonna update the middle of the network, but not activate those changes. Once all of that's done and stable, we'll go to the perimeter and start letting packets be tagged in such a way that they can access that new policy. So update the middle, 
update the edge, and then in the background, delete the old stuff that's not in use anymore. That's the high level idea. More, more, more detail for people that are networking oriented. When a packet enters the network, we stamp it using the programmable switch with a version number that will determine which policy gets used. We update the interior to act on new tags that are not yet in use, so they won't get matched with anything. And then finally, once we know that's done, we go to the perimeter and start stamping packets with the new tags so that they can access the new policy. And once we're comfortable, there are no packets in flight in the network anymore, we delete the old rules because there's no need to keep them anymore. That's it. The worst case, it doubles the number of rules. In practice, most changes to the network have narrower scope and narrower impact and you can make them much smaller. But high level, this ability to have centralized control meant that really simple ideas from distributed systems like a two-phase commit could be implemented directly rather than using these kind of weird mechanisms we were forced to use when we had legacy devices. So uh, maybe I'll pause here to see if there are any, any questions about, about this part of the talk related to, to OpenFlow. So there are a lot of use cases for OpenFlow. We explored a bunch of them. I list a few of them here as sort of use cases to test out our ideas. And these use cases helped us develop better programming abstractions. And then there were some really killer use cases that we had no role in that Google and, and a company called Nasira that spun out of Nick McCune's group at Stanford did, which was to help cloud providers run their private backbones and run their data centers to do traffic engineering in a private backbone similar to the kind of problems I worked at 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 and but unique to the setting that these large cloud providers have. And to run multi-tenant data centers where the data center provider would need to support multiple separate customers, each with their own virtual network. And these became the two killer use cases for, for what became software-defined networking using OpenFlow, really the cloud providers wanting to have the same kind of control over their network that they've always had over their servers and their storage. So stepping away from this part of the talk, we started to um, grapple with the fact that OpenFlow itself was quite limited. Again, it was always a pragmatic protocol, just standardizing what the existing hardware already was capable of doing. And what the existing hardware was capable of doing was pretty limited. OpenFlow 1.0, there was one table for matching and acting on packets. You could act on 12 packet headers and do very simple actions. And if you couldn't handle the packets, otherwise you had to send them to higher level software, a recipe for performance and security problems. So OpenFlow 1.1 got designed and OpenFlow 1.2 and, and, and time went on and every generation of the standard got longer and operated on more headers and was more and more complicated. And there was always still people unsatisfied. And so the group of us involved in OpenFlow became very concerned that where does this end? I mean, this is like second system syndrome happening five times in a row. It was, it was awful. And so we thought, well, gee, we better just put the brakes on because this is clearly not the right end game. In fact, maybe it was time to be a little more ambitious and think maybe OpenFlow was a pragmatic choice and should be jettisoned in favor of something um, more flexible. And in particular, we came back to active networking again, now with a, with a different focus. Hardware designed with programmability in mind, but without compromising speed, without compromising power. Figuring out what's the most programmability you can put in packet processing without giving up on those performance and, and power constraints a performance first variant of active networking, if you will. I wasn't involved in this work at all. This was done by Stanford, Nick McCune's group and folks at Texas Instruments. And if you think about it, stepping back in, at the end of Moore's Law and Denard scaling, now here we are years later, finally, it's, it's really true, that you've got really domain specific processors, right? Graphics processors, GPUs, machine learning processors, TPUs. This is the networking equivalent. It's an attempt to do packet processing at line rate with a restricted programming model that's suitable for packet processing. Is it exactly the right answer to how to do packet processing? Probably not, but it was an awfully good first stab at it. So the idea is still, we parse packets, we have match action processing, but in, now the parser is programmable. We can decide what the packet format is and which fields to extract. The actions you can do are programmable using an arithmetic logic unit, not a deep idea, just borrowing from standard computer architecture. You can decide which fields you match on, how you act on them, change the, the fields as they go through the pipeline, leave some state behind that will affect the handling of the ne next packet, simple registers to store the state. And so now we're starting to see commercial devices on the market that support this simple programmable data plane. And in fact, we have them running in, in the Princeton campus network that I'll allude to in a moment. So 
this was hugely exciting to me. And to me, finally, the pieces come together. I mentioned earlier programming languages was the missing piece. And the, the, the second missing piece was hardware. Something that's not really my own forte, but obviously hugely important. Trying to find a sweet spot between what networking applications need, the language abstractions to support expressing them, and the hardware that's, that is a good match for that programming model. So in designing P4, the, as a language that we call P4, it's uh, Programming Protocol Independent Packet Processors. The group of us got together to design this language with that hardware on the previous slide in mind. With all the lessons we've learned from having programming languages researchers work on OpenFlow, how would we want future networks to be programmed? And we defined a protocol independent language that would define parsers and typed match action tables that would let you write programs that are hopefully target independent so you can work with different kinds of switches and network interface cards and rely on a compiler to generate the lower level Verilog or microcode that would need to run in the device. To be honest on this goal, I think we're still pretty far from achieving it, but that was, that was our goal at the beginning. That, that part's proven much more difficult than we ever imagined and we're still struggling with it now, six years later. And the reconfigurability in the field, that if you buy one of these devices, you should be able to change what your network looks like, to change the thing from a router to a switch, to a firewall, to a NAT, to something else completely by reprogramming the device in the field. In the interest of time, I'm not gonna go into a ton of detail here because I'm almost out of time, but the particular piece where I've been interested is going back to that control loop. I'm really a one trick pony. I think about network control loops and how to make them more programmable. Uh, so I've been thinking a lot about abstractions for programming the measurement functionality to collect the data we want and not be happy with the data we have. And these are just an example of a handful of applications focusing on, on security and performance where we've developed data structures that can run efficiently in this peculiar programming model that I've been describing so far. And more generally to develop general telemetry platforms that will allow us to write high level queries of the type big data application support on packets as if they're all available at one central location and yet compile them to run directly as much as possible in the individual data planes of the switches through compilation technology. Languages meets hardware with a compiler in the middle to translate high level queries a network administrator would care about into actual processing of packets using compact data structures in the hardware. So that's what I still work on now. And I'm really interested in, in also going one step further, not just passive data collection, but affecting the control on the packets as well to integrate um, not just the measurement and the analysis, but the control too. Uh, in the interest of time, I won't go through this example in, in detail, but essentially we went back to load sensitive routing. How do I get traffic to flow the way I want it to? Rather than telling the routers what link weights to use or having a routing control platform, say what forwarding table to use, can we actually implement the distributed routing protocol we actually want directly in the switch? Centralized intent, but distributed implementation. And that, I won't go through this in the interest of time, but we, we did work to implement this directly in the switches. And so now we can do the whole controller for this one specific application, load sensitive routing completely in the switches directly in the data plane. But stepping back, the longer term goal here is to make this control loop integrated. I think when I was at AT&T and even when I was at Michigan, I really thought of these three steps as separate. You measure, you analyze and optimize and you control. And we thought about it that way because we weren't allowed to think about it differently because the measurement data was whatever the vendor would let you have. The control was whatever knobs the vendor would let you tweak and you would analyze or optimize given whatever data you've got to do whatever you're allowed to do. But in practice, what you really like is to be able to integrate all of this and be able to state in a high level declarative way, these are my goals and my objectives, my constraints. I want to minimize the most congested link in my network and still route traffic through a firewall or still block a certain set of traffic that's unwanted and synthesize the device local programs that collectively will implement the control loop that achieves this goal. We're not there yet. I mean, I get the slide I rushed over is one tiny example of doing this for a single application, but more generally, I'm really excited about the ability to leverage techniques from programming languages to express these high level goals leverage the techniques from the compiler community to synthesize device local programs that are faithful to the restricted capabilities and resources of high-speed networking hardware. And that's, that's a big focus uh, of my work right now. So I'll just end by saying what we've done over this, this whole body of work by, by myself and my group and also by, by others in the community is keep pushing a boulder up a hill. We started by making the management plane programmable because that's the only place we could innovate. Eventually, 
the community worked on making the control plane programmable by having open interfaces to the data plane. And now the data plane itself is up for grabs uh, with newer programmable packet processing hardware. So now the stack is programmable. And now we have the hard problem to think of, of where does the functionality actually belong? To put it not where we can, but, but where it actually should go to solve the problems we actually face. And we're just now starting to think about that. So I'll just step back and say, for me, the lessons from this whole journey, from the projects that failed to the ones that were more successful, was first to identify use cases, to find someone who's struggling, someone in pain. A network administrator is always my person. I always empathize for the network administrator. And frankly, nobody likes to talk to them as much as I do, so they're always happy to tell me their stories. Find someone who's struggling and find out why and, and figure out what technical problem they're solving in some unnatural way because the technology doesn't work for them. A lot of these problems, particularly in networking, are thorny and multifaceted, and they end up benefiting a lot from connecting with a whole bunch of other areas of computer science, electrical engineering, and in some cases, other even broader areas. And I found that to be a really fun aspect of being in an industrial research lab. And, and even in academia, there's a lot of opportunity for that. And finally, knowing some history, a lot of ideas come around again. The 1980s work on the phone network, the active networks work in the late 90s. Um, they were things I was dismissive about when I first heard about them, but they've come back around and actually influenced my own work profoundly, uh, despite my skepticism about them. And sometimes old ideas, like my, my, even my PhD work, uh, become new again because the environments change, the technologies change. And so it's, it's, it's actually useful. We're kind of an ahistorical field sometimes because the field moves so quickly, it's easy to be dismissive of history, but I'm starting to get old and crotchety enough now that I think it's actually useful to, to study some history. Uh, so finally, I'll just say there are a couple of lessons. The last two lessons are sort of contradictory, but I think they're both true. One is to not fight what you can't change. And then, and then the projects I mentioned in the routing control platform work, we assumed we couldn't change the software that the routers ran, and so we worked within it. In the open flow work, we assumed we couldn't change the hardware. And in the more recent work before, we assume we can change the hardware, but we can't give up processing packets at line rate under power constraints. That said, each of those generations to change were possible because of the successes of the previous one. And so fighting to enable new kinds of change by building, deploying, and, and sharing prototype systems, articulating vision with a larger community of people and fostering the community so that more people are able to do that kind of work to push the boulder uh, further up the field. And so finally, I just wanna say thank you, particularly here at Michigan, it's a pleasure to be around some of my former professors and particularly my advisor. Uh, and at at and I really wor enjoyed working in Albert Greenberg's group who taught me a lot about how to, to run uh, operational networks and do research that connects with people who solve real problems. And I have a lot more details about the specific people I work with on each of these projects uh, in the bibliography, but I think I'll stop here and I think there's probably just a minute or two left for questions. I'm happy to, to take any questions. <laughs>